hell was licking up his legs when he woke up. So I'm, I'm assuming that he recognized me when he yelled out, I'm burning up, I'm burning up. He never did say, hey, I recognize you. He just, you know, you know, had that familiar, familiar look to when he con- uh, made eye contact with me. And well, I said, well, you had a rough bit bit of it. And he didn't really say a whole lot other than yes, no, uh, two questions, or give you what l- the least bit of uh, information that he'd get by with after that. So uh, after that, I don't know what happened to the guy. Couldn't tell you. I don't know if the guy is still with us. But that myself, just telling you now, I've told the story several times, but every time I tell that story, I'm just chilling all over telling that story. Yeah, crazy. So crazy, crazy. Now you also. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, did, no, go, go ahead and ask your question. No, no. You said you had a dogman story too. Dogman story. Well, I had another NDE story to bud. Oh, go, go, go ahead. One. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, this is kind of off, polar opposites of each other. Okay. Uh, the ones. That, this was many years before this particular story that I just shared with you happened. I was a new snot nosed respiratory therapist. I thought I knew everything, but I really didn't know a thing. Kind of deal. Yeah. And, and um, one, one evening I was coming into work and we do what's called a, a shift change report. So you report to each other from the, uh, from the outgoing shift members to the on, oncoming shift members what's happening in the hospital that night, that day. And more or less, it, it's either a 5 to 15 minutes, you know, um, exchange of information. And that night was, you know, pretty decent, not too bad at all. Um, short report. But right at the end of the report, we get what's called a code blue, and that's the alert at some hospitals that says, hey, there's somebody's down, they need uh, respiratory therapy and emergency re- alerts and expect that you want to do CPR, the same deal, but this was an ICU and not um, ER. So this, oh, uh, so this particular spot no longer exists, so I'm, I feel safe that I'm not going to say where it was or whatever. But anyway, I run down the hall, which is just a short sprint. Within a half a minute, I'm, I'm at the back door or the side door of the ICU. And how ICUs are set up, they're in a horseshoe pattern, either you know shaped exactly like a horseshoe with a nurse, nursing desk centralized so they have a panoramic view of all the rooms available in the ICU unit. If you ever do go back in ICU, I hope you don't. Well, I but, hope uh, not either. Just like, yeah, I you know, hope, hope nobody does. But uh, it, Next time you walk into it, and if you're hearing the story, just look, and you, you'll notice that, yeah, it, uh, most ICU units are set up in a horseshoe pattern. So this particular room that I was alerted to was in the back, very back row. You know, like if you're looking at a horseshoe, it was actually in, in the bow of the horseshoe. But it was a squared, squared horseshoe <laughs> kind of deal, which was weird. But anyway, so walk in, and here's this uh, young, or not young lady, old lady. One of these little granny, real frail, wears her skin on her bones, kind of looking lady, hair up in a bun. And uh, here's this nurse, for whatever reason, you know, I, I, uh, was instead of doing CPR, was trying to establish uh, a line on the patient, meaning putting an IV in it. And why I remember that, I don't know, but it just pops out in my, in my mind. I was like, I thought to myself, why aren't you doing CPR? <laughs> kind of deal. So I didn't say that out loud. I just thought it. So here I am. Another lady was right behind me, and she started CPR. And I grab a hold of the Ambu bag. And it's, you know, those big bio, uh, bags with, it looks like a big bulb of syringe, but it's huge. And it's got a mask on it, an Ambu mask. And you do like a, the jaw lift, uh, head tilt maneuver to you know clear the airway by physically lifting up the jaw off the off the back of the throat so you can clear the tongue to get the most air passage that you can and i start bagging the patient as you see in most er scenarios that you see dramatized on tv so here i am bagging the patient and we're doing cpr and the doc walks in and got all the you know another 
a level of chaos, but organi- organized chaos. Everybody's got a role, and they know their role. It's not assigned to them. They just, you know, we just automatically fill in the spot that's vacant if we've got the skill to do it. Okay, if that makes sense. So here I am bagging, and we do CPR on this this lady. Now, mind you, this lady is flatlined. I confirmed that, and as I was uh, listening for breath sounds, uh, as I was get, getting in, into it, listening to breath sounds a little bit, as uh, I was switching out to do chest compression, switching back and doing the, the bagging, I was listening for breath sounds to make sure we're actually ventilating patients. The patient was flatlined, meaning no activity. The heart wasn't beating at all. She, If we left her alone, she would have been buried after that. So in we other finally words, get her back In other out. words, she was dead. She was dead. She was dead, dead. Flatlined, dead. Corpse. You know, yeah, corpse. You know, heal, heals to Jesus kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of vulgar. I'm sorry. No, that's Please okay. Yeah, that. I was. I almost said it. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, for the rest, uh, she finally came back, and for whatever reason, this is one of the few times that I have ever seen a physician not intubate somebody that had flatline. You know, I don't know. What, well, I actually have my suspicions, but it would be kind of degrading to mention it because it's. It's a physician's choice, but anyway. Uh, this patient never was awake. I never seen her before in my entire life, before I you know, started doing CPR in this life. Couldn't tell you who she was, where she come from. Did all my charting, did all my work for that night, never saw her awake, never heard any reports that she was awake or anything of that nature. And the next day I come in, I had ICU duty again. And, of course, like I mentioned before in the previous story, uh, they were doing serial EKGs on this lady, checking to make sure, you know, one, if she had a heart attack, is, is the heart attack killing itself or is the heart attack progressing itself? I mean, you know, just by looking at the EKG. So uh, here I am running in to introduce myself. Hey, I'm Sean. I'm here to do an EKG. And with EKGs, you have to be really cautious of patients uh, uh, personal space because of where you have to put these leads on so I'm you know gently instructing her that hey you need to lift up your your skirt just or your skirt your gown a little bit to for me to get to the bottom half of her uh, left ch- uh, chest cage and put those stickers on and uh, I was doing a little small chit chat as I, as I do with all female or male patients that I do these EKGs on she looked at me, up at me. She said, "You were there last night." And I said, "Well, yeah." And of course, you got to remember. Here I am, you know, literally, you know, probably a couple was in a couple years into my career. At the start of my career, I really didn't know a heck of a lot, and I wasn't prepared for what this lady was about ready to tell me. And I, I looked at her, and the first thing that popped out of my mouth I said, "How did you know that?" She said, "I was floating above the bed." Ooh. And she said that I was floating above the bed, and I didn't literally say anything. I was literally dumbfounded, literally dumbfounded. And she said I was floating above the bed, and she explained to me in great detail what I was doing to her. You know, you had a mask on my face and helping me to breathe and pushing this bag, squeezing this bag Something to that that nature, and then she started pointing at all the pay, all the uh, nursing staff and explaining what this person was doing. This person was taking notes. This person was giving me drugs. This person was pushing pushing my chest. And then she said there was another person that wasn't there, and she explained to me who this person was. And the reason this sticks out in my head, but uh, that is not normal to see in in. Uh, uh, in a hospital arena anymore. If you remember those nightingale hats, those white hats that stand on top of the female uh, nurses that they wear around, I don't know if you remember those. Oh, back in the 60s and stuff like that, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Well, well it, it, when I first started, that was still uh, part of the culture in the, in, in the older culture, the older nurses that worked there. And then in some of the trainee nurses that come in to do clinicals, uh, some of them were required to wear those nursing hats. 
And she and she explained this person had a nursing hat on, and there was only one person in that ICU. And it was an older lady, and sweet lady, but uh, older lady. And she explained what she looked like, and she said that uh, she was uh, the one that shot me. <laughs> and I'm, wow. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm literally just in awe. Uh, I didn't say a whole lot to her. I can't even remember what I said back to her. Uh, kind of, kind of stuff. I know I excused myself and I said I hope you feel better. And I had more, more contact with her throughout the night, but I didn't say a whole lot. I says I'm just here to do EKG again. But she didn't say a whole lot. But she did say that I'm only here for just a small amount of time, and he's coming back to get me. And I was like, okay, is there anything I can do for you? I remember saying something to that nature. But I was just so in awe. Now, the story doesn't stop here. Uh -oh. over, over the course of a few days, this lady uh, sees people and visits with them, you know, friends and family. And as soon as she's done speaking her piece, she mentions from what I have been told. Now, I've only heard her say, uh, I'm only here for a short time, he's come to get me. What she was referring to Jesus. So after she would talk to these, pa these people and say her peace to them, she would refuse to see these people anymore. And she got down to, over the course of a few days, she's seen everybody she wants to see and talk to. She went on and allowed uh, hospital staff in and out of her room. And I wasn't there at that time when she passed, but she did pass after the last person she saw that she wanted to see within a matter of a few hours. Oh, wow. But, yeah, that, that's the spooky part. And the only reason I know that, I, I come back and I have asked how that little lady was doing, and then I got the, that telling of that story. So there is, some, there is some spooky stuff out there, folks, is all I can tell you. It's real. Uh... I can tell you all kinds of hospital stories that would literally curl your toenails. But don't yeah, you don't want to? Then you'll scare people. In the, and w let's say they're having a heart attack; they're going to be too scared to go to the hospital to get you know help. Oh no, no, no! If you need help, go get help. But uh, this is the you know the reason I like telling these two tales. There's two two opposite polar ends of the, of this in the East story. Story. You know, obviously, I feel that the you know the hell in the story, as I call it, the gentleman you know righted whatever was wrong with him inside, and I know that the lady went off uh, to the, the great beyond and got a reward. So, or that's my personal belief. Or she could have been a real bad lady and got the opposite too. <laughs> well, you never do know that. So, yeah. Uh, all I can say that's my feeling, and I can't. Uh, you know, honestly, when you do tell these paranormal stories, you you r r literally don't have a lot to stand on other than I've seen this, or if uh, like if a Bigfoot's involved, I've got a Bigfoot footprint or hair, or, or I've got a picture. Which you know, one of the shaman uh, stories I've got, I've actually got a picture. <laughs> so, anyway, there you go. Well, you know about the near-death experiences, stuff like that. A good friend of mine who just passed away here recently, Art Bell, i known him for many, many, many years. In fact, he's the one that got me out of retirement and, and, and convinced me to get back in doing a paranormal talk show. And, you know, I'll be yeah. eternally grateful for what he did for me. But, you know, uh, John Lear, many, 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 many moons ago, told one time uh, Art you know, don't go to the light when you pass on because that's a trick. You know, and it, he goes, go for the darkness. And, you know, it really, really, you know, had Art mm -hmm. really confused for the rest of his life at that. Well, when you go, I, 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 do I you go I to the. That podcast. Yeah, well, <laughs> me and him talked about it about a year ago. And, and you know, he died uh, on April 13th. What better, you mm -hmm. know, on a Friday, uh, the 13th, what better yeah, what day yeah. to die? But I'm just wondering when he passed on, if he went to the light or if he went to the darkness. Because, you know. Well, me, I, I actually have an Arbell story. Oh, oh go <laughs> ahead. Go it's ahead. Kinda, it's kind of weird. But when Arbell was on um, the, that old show of uh, Dark Matter, he had that spooky matter show. Oh yeah, 